I pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's table lay a higher flame that I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher For whatever reason, God put me talking out of the book of Ezekiel and not really something I've ever done before. And I think it's because Ezekiel was raised up as a prophet during times like these. The people were in trouble and they were struggling and, and they'd lost faith and they'd lost their way and they were being plagued and they had all these problems. And Ezekiel stepped up and unfortunately brought a very harsh message. But it was something that the people needed to hear so they would return to God. And so last week, which the message was awful for me to do last week, was about, was about shepherds. Good shepherds, bad shepherds, and just how pastors can get in situations where they, they can really mislead a flock and how God feels about that. And, um, and you know, it put a little large burden on my heart to be the right kind of pastor. Now this week, the, the, the focus switches to the body of Christ and where are they at? And it's pretty harsh. The, the words are harsh. This is a, this is not a, this is not a, uh, this is a sto toe stomper, I guess you'd say, message. And, and, and it's one that God put on my heart and we need to hear it. It all starts with the idea that everything we do should be for the glory of God. But the other side of that is everything that God does is for His glory, not for our glory. And we, and we struggle with that. We, we, we have this idea that we somehow have some sort of control over the Almighty or that he, we can put him in a box or he can control us or, you know, I mean, or, he, or we control him rather. He can control us. He has ways. But um, I think that we need to really understand how much he loves us. And I'm going to start this, this off, but I put some notes in here that I need to talk about the 1%, about all of it being for God's glory, about regeneration and a little bit about denomination. So if I'll find all that in the middle of all this, I don't know. But this sermon really comes out of what David said in Psalms 8, starting in verse 3. It says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with all glory and honor. What is man that you are mindful of him? I don't think we understand. There's nothing about us, nothing about even Christians that God should care to love us, to care to even know what's going on in our lives, but that's not our God. He loves us because he loves us. There's nothing in us that would make us love him, that he would make him love us. He blesses us, he gives us grace and mercy and hope only to bring glory to his kingdom, not to bring glory to us. So that's where we have to start today. Let us pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the gospel. Because through the gospel we understand where salvation comes from. And only through the gospel can we live through these times that we're living in and understand why you're doing what you're doing. If we have a full understanding of the message and that all things that happen under heaven are done for your glory, for those that love you, if we can just get that, if we can wrap our head around that, that it's all about you, Lord, then I think we can go through these times with a whole new perspective. It's not about us. It is not about us. In Jesus' name, amen. So I was thinking about something. I don't like to share my all of my past with folks, but it, there was a time when I rode a motorcycle for three years of my life, and I and I uh, 
lived a, a little bit on the other side of things. But God always would always call me back. He would always work on me in those situations. And in that world, um, there are there's a group of people called the One Percenters. And this is for outsaw, outlaw motorcycle gangs. And they, those guys have killed someone for their club. That's where their commitment level is. They're one percenters. They're the one percent of, of the motorcycle club that is willing to go out and do and live like that and, and, and actually kill somebody. What I would tell you my message came from today is, are we the one percent that would die for Jesus and die for the message and live like that? Are we, are we the one percent? You know, the church is never in trouble in times like these. Everybody thinks the church is going to fall apart because we're not having Sunday service or don't have a parking lot or what don't have a place to do it. It doesn't work like that. If you are a regenerated child of God, and, and, I, and, I, and unfortunately, or fortunately either way, I gave part of this message the other night at Chrissy's house because they asked me to get up and speak for 10 minutes, and this is what I was thinking on and working on, so it, it's already been out there a little bit. But denominationally, does not matter. That's, it's not even an issue. What matters is those people that are in the pews that are regenerated, those that live for Christ, those that are 100% all in. And there are some in every church. And so when you talk about the body of Christ, it's 15 people from this Baptist church over here. It's 10 people from this Methodist church over here. It's eight people from that church over there. That's the body. The body is never impacted by this world. The body of Christ is always all in. Those people who are regenerated are always in it, in it for God, 100%. And I, and I think we need to live like that and understand that. There's nothing in us, there's nothing of, of, of us that makes us deserving of what God would do for us. But if your heart is changed, then you are a new creation. And that is probably the most important scripture I'm going to share with you today. Let me go over here. In Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the, world of, the word of reconciliation. What it says there is God, and in my, one of my favorite thoughts about the Bible and the gospel message is that we are counted as righteous. We are not righteous. It's kind, and I always use this analogy because it's the one put on, God put on my heart 100 years ago. It's like when, you're, when you were a kid and you played ball. Or, well, I'm talking about like pickup game in a parking lot or something. And somebody says, I want you and you and you and you and there's that kid nobody wants and then finally somebody takes him. That's what it's like for us. We're that kid who doesn't deserve it. We've got no skill, no talent, no nothing. But God picks us and he counts us as righteous. We are not righteous. We never will be. But he counts us as righteous. And, and, that, and that brings up the reason why God... There's, there's a couple of, of things we need to understand. The difference between holiness and righteousness. Our God is holy. And in fact, Scripture says He is holy, holy, holy. Holiness is separateness. In the Old Testament, when they talk about holy things, they were the things of the temple. They were things that were used to praise God. They could be candles, they could be whatever. It could be the actual tabernacle itself. It was something that was set apart to be used by God. But God himself is holy, holy, holy. And, I, and I, when I think about that, I think about the fact that God, it's almost like if, if the earth was the first level of holiness and heaven is the second level of holiness and the universe is the third level, our God is outside of all of that. He is so far removed from everything because he is not like anything that we understand. He is above all that. He is... He, and, and we need to understand we are called to be holy, but what does that mean? It means we're called to be set apart. And that doesn't mean set apart and not of God, because you can be set apart. Right now, everybody's set apart. We're all at home and, and set apart. 
But you have to be set apart for God's purposes and live into that. Now, the other side of that is righteousness. The two things are related because when we look at God, the way that we understand that He is so different is because He's 100% righteous. It's what separates Him from us. It is, it is something that a man can understand. Is that, but that's just one thing. God is all-knowing, all-seeing, all-present. He's all of those other things that we cannot be. He's that other. He is other. We cannot be that. But the one thing we can understand about God is that He is holy and separated from us because He is holy. And, 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 and we are set apart when we become children of God. When we are regener regenerated, we are called to be His children, and we are set apart, and we have a purpose and a job. And, and it's not just to be set apart. It's to be children of God who walk with the King. That is who we're called to be. When I think about where we are today and, and where people are in this COVID crisis, we have the perfect opportunity to get back close to God. We are set apart. We've got time to study. We've got time to do all the things we do. And it comes down to what do you do with that? We, we live in a world and in, in, in society where people think that if you walk up to the front of a church and you say a prayer and give your life to Jesus in prayer in that one moment, that it's all over. But what I would tell you is there's, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of people who said that prayer, but there was no change in them, no change in their heart, no change in how they live, no, no, no regeneration. And, and, and I'll get to the story in just a minute in Ezekiel where, where God tells us what that's going to look like. But, you know, I, I, one, of my, one of my examples, I guess, would be somebody's not been to church in five years. They got mad because a new preacher came or the music changed or they changed buildings or whatever their reason is. If that person didn't go find another church, if that person's living in sin, and I go call on them as a pastor and say, you need to come back to church and you need to get back to your life. And, and, and the conversation would probably go something like this. Yeah, pastor, I know I need to be in church. Yeah, pastor, I know I need to be reading my Bible. Yeah, pastor, I know I need to be doing all these things. Let me tell you, I don't think those people are saved. If, if, it, is not the, if it is not their goal in life, to be a part of the body of Christ. And when they sin, it doesn't bother them. If, if When they live in the world and it doesn't affect them, when they can keep doing it and there's nothing that bothers them at all with, what, with, with their lifestyle and all the things they're doing, I question their salvation. And there are, there are a lot of what I call frog water Christians. They were raised in church. They've been sitting in the pew all their lives. And, and the, if the story of the frog is if you put him in hot water, he'll jump out. But if you put him in cold water and you gradually heat it up, it'll eventually boil and kill him. You see, they, there are people who, who've never been regenerated because they've never totally committed. And the reason I know that is because it's not the most important thing in their life. Jesus Christ is not the most important thing. And so I think the prophet's message in Ezekiel is my message to you guys today. It's time to wake up and understand and listen. It's not a message people want to hear. No, they don't. It's a message they want to walk out the back door. I get it. And that's fine, but it's the message I'm called to preach. So I'm going to go to Ezekiel chapter 36. Verse 22. you got to realize he said this several thousand years ago. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. Let's stop right there. God saves people for His sake, for His glory. Not for your glory. He saves people for His glory. It is a work of God. People put so much faith in what they have done and in, 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 in their walk and what they do. I'll give you a quick example from the Bible. Jesus calls Lazarus from the tomb, right? So you say Jesus has the power, but Lazarus wouldn't have, wouldn't have, would have not heard him had he not woken him first. See, God wakes us and then he gives us a message, and then we can come out of our tomb. It's not that we are the ones in charge. When God talks to us and gives us that message to wake us up, he woke us up so we could hear it. 
When we're dead in our sin and we're, our, our hearts are hardened, we can't hear anything. There's nothing we can do, but we need to understand that everything that God does, especially when it relates to salvation, is for His glory. It is for His glory. And so when we, when we go back to the verse here, and this is the way all of us, uh, here's the other side. Therefore say the house of Israel, says Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. When Christians claim to be Christians, well, let me back up. When people claim to be Christians and they go out in the world and they live like everybody else, you're profaning God's name to the nations. That they, they like, well, why? you're no different. What, what, why would I want to be like you? There's nothing there. There's, no, there's, there's nothing to you. There's no depth of person. God has chosen this time, I believe, to bring churches back, to have a great revival. I do, understand, I do truly believe that. And, I, and I, unfortunately, it requires people understanding why. It's all about God's glory. It's not about us. We are to praise and worship God. And if you don't like it right now, that's what people in heaven do 24-7, 365 for the rest of eternity. So you better get a little practice in right now on, on, who, on worshiping God because that's what the rest of eternity is, is worshiping God. And it says in verse 23, And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I have hallowed in you before their eyes. The message of that verse right there is, and I've seen this, when you have a person, and we really don't have an example person in our church, but when you have a person who's lived so far on the other side of things, so far, and they get converted, and they're 100% regenerated, you can't keep them out of church. Even though they're smelly, and they're ugly, and they look awful, and, 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 they, don't, and they don't even feel welcome, they keep coming. Because there's something in them that desires to spend time and serve God and do all that they know how to do. That is when God regenerates someone like that. Whether you like them, whether you hate them, the world notices. They notice the change. They notice that the person, God had did that work. And that is how God shows his power on this earth is when he takes a person who was nobody said could be saved and says, look, you're mine, child, and I'm going to bring you back to me. God disciplines those who he loves. He disciplines. And if God hadn't disciplined you lately, if you aren't having struggles, if you aren't struggling with things, if things aren't bothering you, if, there's, if, if your life is absolutely perfect, then I question what's going on right now. Life was never meant to be easy. But God said he'd always be with us. So I just want you to think about that. Has God disciplined you lately? Has he really touched your heart about something you've been doing? Has, hey, stop doing that. Has he, has he put something in your way? These are things that we need to understand. Verse 24. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. When God cleans you, I have to laugh about the old fishing thing. You catch him, we'll clean, he'll clean them. When God cleans you, you're clean. When you're regenerated, you're a new spirit, you're clean. When he washes you, you're done. And I truly believe that, that once you're clean like that, and, and it talks about that in just a second, you don't want to go back. Spurgeon has an example, uh, and if you don't know who Spurgeon is, he's a great preacher from the past that he uses of a pig in slot who, who likes... You take a pig and you put him in a fine restaurant and you put the finest meal in the world over on one table and you put a bucket of pig slop over another table and that pig is going to run like crazy straight to, straight to that slop. But if by some miracle you could walk up and touch that pig and make him a human, in that moment he would throw up he, would, he, he couldn't even handle what was in him. He couldn't handle the smell, the taste. He would throw up. He couldn't get anywhere near it. It couldn't be anything around it. He would immediately go over to the other table. Folks, that's what regeneration looks like. 
When you cannot stand sin, when you cannot stand to be in it, live in it, be near it, when you hate the things that God hates, love the thing that God loves, that is what change looks like. That's what regeneration looks like. You know, we, we have the bad habit. All of, I mean, I'll be very honest. I mean, I've been a Christian since I was very young. And what happens to us is we get drawn into the world things and we start watching our favorite shows. And at first it bothers us that they said those cuss words or they had that scene that you shouldn't watch and, or whatever. And you just keep watching and keep watching and it keeps dulling you down and keeps dulling you down. At some point, God will probably discipline you for that. And I hope he does because I hope he does it to me too. If I'm doing something wrong like that, we need to stop doing those things. When you have a regenerate heart, and you know, we all have moments where we're not where we're supposed to be. 100% of us do. We're, when our walk is not as tight as it should be. But, but a regenerated Christian will never stay long from where he needs to be on the path because God will discipline you. He wants you to walk in his ways. He wants you to live for him. He, he wants you to make that change and live like that. So th this story here today is, is, is just, it's been going for thousands of years, this, what was going to happen now. It gets much better. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. You're going to get rid of all your idols. All the things that distract you from God, you're going to remove from your life because that's what happens when you have a regenerate heart. Verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. What God is saying is, without Jesus in our lives, our hearts are stone. Nothing good in us. Nothing can penetrate that heart. Nothing can, there's nothing about us that is not anything but evil. But through the Holy Spirit and through the power, He can change us to have a good heart, a loving heart, a caring heart, not only for God, but for our fellow man. And then verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Once you have the Holy Spirit in you, you can't walk outside of that. You should be getting tripped up all the time. If you're truly living for God and, and you try to take that other road, which I've done, God will slam doors in your face. He'll make accidents happen. He'll make all kind of crazy stuff to get your attention and discipline you and get you back on the right path. We are all blessed to have a relationship with Jesus Christ if we do because it comes with this warranty that says, you know what, if you step out of line, you're my child, I'm going to take care of this and I'm going to get you back on the path. We have that 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 voice in our head. We have the, the circumstances. Our God is a God of circumstances. He creates every situation that we get ourselves into besides those ones that we create ourselves. But I mean, He creates circumstances that allow us to return to Him. He creates circumstances to allow us to walk for Him and with Him. We cannot help but walk for Him if He is in our life and we, and we focus on Him. And, I, and, I, and I, you know, we don't like being disciplined, but guess what? It works. I, you know, we're supposed to fear the Lord, and, 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 that's, and that's how it's supposed to be. Verse 27, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. He's going to put you where he wants to put you, put you to doing what he wants you to do, and you will be his people, and he will be your God. Wherever you are, He's got that circle planned for you. People you're supposed to interact with, people you're supposed to love on, people you're supposed to help, people you're supposed to witness to, people you're supposed to... I mean, you have a place on planet Earth that he set aside for you to be your spot. And, and I'm assuming for this crowd here this morning, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine, ten, about 15 cars worth of people, this is your spot. This is where you're supposed to be this morning. And it says, I will deliver you from all uncleanliness, I will call for my grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. In other words, he's going to bless you every kind of way. I will multiply the fruit of your trees and increase your fields so that you will never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will, be, you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. If you don't loathe yourself when you sin now, as a child of God, you should hate yourself. You should pray and beg forgiveness and please, God, don't let me do that again. I do it all the time. I'm human, but I'm also a child of God. Verse 32. 
Not for your sake do I do this. You got that? God says, not for your sake do I do this. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded of your ways. Verse 33. Thus says the Lord God, on that day I will cleanse you from all your iniquities and I will, be able to, you, I will enable you to dwell in the cities and ruins shall be rebuilt. In other words, all the desolation, all the things that are torn up in your life, all the problems. And I, and I, I know I don't see that as much here in, in, our, in a church setting as I do in the ministries that I'm involved with. But there are people who've lost everything. They've lost their families, their lives, their jobs. They've been in prison. And Jesus steps in and regenerates that person. And first thing they do is they get their heart. Then they get their own life back. Then they get a job. Then they get a family back. And, then they, and it, just, it just grows from there. Because see, God wants to bless every one of us. He wants us to have that love which we deserve, not deserve, but that he wants to give us through families and friends and in, in the fellowship of believers. You know, one of the things that's interesting uh, that I was talking to a friend about the other day, and this is kind of the whole denominational thing again. If two people sit on a plane beside each other and, and they're of different denominations and they strike up a conversation and they're both regenerated, loving Christians, that's a brother in Christ sitting next to me. We love each other. We immediately hit it off. We, we are family and we understand that. But if it's just a person from another denomination sits next to me and they're not really a believer, you know what? We don't have a lot of common ground. There's, there's, there's nothing there. Because what makes us family is the blood of Jesus Christ. What makes us a part of each other and to want to care and love for the body of Christ is Jesus Christ. He is the bride. He is the one that we are all beholden to. He is the one we look up to. He's the one we love and honor and obey, just like a marriage. In verse 34, it says, The desolate land shall be tilled instead of lying desolate in the sight of who pass by. This land will be what that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden. The wasted, the desolate, the ruined cities are now fortified and inhabited. The nations which are left all around shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted where what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. God restores people for a reason. Yes, part of it is because He loves us. But the other part of it is is because it shows His glory. He uses the most unlikely people to change the world. And I'm looking at a whole bunch of us unlikely people right here. He can use every one of us to change the world in some way. You'd be surprised what you could do. I don't care if you're 90 or if you're 10, and even the you that are 9, wherever she went. It doesn't matter how old you are. It matters who you walk with and how you live. Let me see if I covered all my topics while we're still here. I think so. I think we got it. So let me let me close with with I'll close with one scripture. I'm gonna go to Ephesians chapter two. And you may and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. It says that we were all once dead. Only through regeneration can we get to the next verse here. But God, don't you love but God? But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And by grace we have been saved and raised up together and made to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's the story. That's our story. We were dead in our trespasses. We were dead. We had a heart of stone. We were useless to his kingdom. But he chose... He chose to save us for His glory, not for our own. So I ask you today, as we sit here in this beautiful sunshiny day that He made,
to look at your own heart and humbly understand how much He loves us, but not because of who we are. Because He loves us. Just because He does. And we need to humble ourselves and live in ways and, and, and understand that, that we need to be regenerated if we are not. I remember a guy talking about a person who was really struggling, really, really struggling with the idea that they were saved or not. And I get that a lot as a pastor. How do I know that I'm saved? How do I know that I'm saved? And the pastor had tried a lot of different things with the guy over and over again. And he, couldn't, he just wasn't comfortable that he was saved. And he finally said, I'll tell you what, you all have a strip club in this town? He said, yeah. He said, you go to that strip club and have a big old party and have a great time. And, and, and he said, no, I can't do that. And he kept on, he kept saying, you, you need to go do that. You need to have a wild time. And he finally said, I cannot do that. And he said, why can't you do that? He said, because I fear God. You're saved. If you fear God and you understand how much He loves you and how much you love Him, if you fear God, that's where it starts. It doesn't make you perfect. We all fumble and mess up and stumble and do all the wrong things. There's a huge difference between living totally carnally for yourself and living for God and understanding that there's a little bit of stuff that, that you mess up on, but when you do, your heart says, uh-uh, you don't need to do that. The Holy Spirit says, uh-uh. There, there's a way to know that you're saved. And I, and, I, and I pray that every one of you has that comfort right now to know that you're saved. And I, and, I, and I pray that this message today, as harsh as it might have been, helps you to understand that everything we do should be for the glory of God because everything He does is for His glory. Amen? I do you, Father, we thank You for our time this morning. And we know that we are sinners. And we come humbly before You now, knowing we have failed miserably at times. We, we, we just, we don't know even know how to begin to start sometimes. But we also know that you want to use every one of us for your glory. You want to save every one of us for your glory. And it's all about you, Lord, and what you can do through each and every one of us. You can show a lost and dying world, your son, through our lives. And you can choose the least of these to make that happen. And I just ask you, Lord, right now that if, to use us all in the ways that you would see fit, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for your son. And Lord, just bless us through this week. Help us to prevail through this storm of pandemic and all the other issues that come with that. Those that couldn't be at church today, Lord, give them reason to come. Put your heart on them. Draw them to yourself. Draw them to church. Draw them to others who would, could bring them to Christ, Lord. If they're, whatever the reason might be, Lord, it might be a great reason. And I, and I know that too, Lord. Bless us, Lord, and keep us this week and, and watch over us. In Jesus' name, amen.